get started because we have a very short period of time together. It's exactly 20 of 11. So we have with us Carolyn Wood from the now the medical school, formerly the Kennedy School, and Monica Higgins from the Ed School. And I'm Nancy Kane from the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, and we're all uh, educators. Uh, we're all very much supporting the, the educational mission of our respective schools, sometimes against the grain, sometimes more with the grain. Um, and many of us, and I think all three of us, have been in different parts of Harvard, in different parts of our, of our careers in education. So um, what strikes all of us, I think, is that although we want to do a lot of focus on this, a lot of the conferences around this instructor at the middle of this circle, mm. that that context that the instructor is in has an enormous impact on how well that instructor uh, can perform. And you know, should we be thinking of how to evaluate the quality of the decision making that creates this context? I mean, one colleague looked at this and said, oh, you're talking about the culture. Yes, but it's not an immutable culture. And what are some of the decisions that, you know, or the ways decisions are made that affect that culture, that create that culture? So that's what we wanted to have this group be talking about. And even figuring out how to ask about it was really quite a long process. We really appreciate the input of the Hill people and we've all just been playing circles around it. So this is from a, a public health concept called the Socioecological Framework for Health where the patient or the, you know, the individual's in the middle, but then there's all these different influences on the individual. But we thought we'd sort of you know, steal from it a little bit and apply it to uh, teaching and talk about And so what, what I'd like for people to talk about is, you know, how are decisions made about these things in your institutions, what's your experience, and what could be improved? What, where are we, how can we come up with a list of best practices to improve the culture of teaching uh, and the likelihood of success of teaching in our schools? I'm just, I'm going to go very quickly, I mean, uh, in our school, we have a set of students whose expectations are that uh, attendance is optional and that uh, they should be told what to think because they went to, frankly, medical schools, many of them, and no offense, but that's where a lot of them got their habits. So that's, just that alone has been a real challenge for those of us who believe in more interactive and engaging and, you know, presence of mind and body. Um, in terms of how programs are structured, you can have a program that is actually not built so that courses build on each other or that people are overlapping or that they're well coordinated and so the students get the maximum benefit out of whatever that you're doing as an instructor. So things about how those educational programs are designed and coordinated is another, you know, one of the many things that can affect the quality of what's going on in the classroom. A school-wide policy that we've all talked about, you know, promotion criteria, although that may not, in our school, we find most of our senior faculty are teaching, and, and some of that teaching is highly variable. Um, but also how teaching is paid for, what kind of classroom facilities are out there for you to teach in, um, all kinds of different types of decisions that um, affect whether you can actually teach in the most interactive way possible, how well your IT systems work, uh, your uh, technology works, um, whether you have support to do technology assisted learning. And then external forces. Carolyn and I were having a great discussion at one point about the role that accreditation plays in medical school driving so much of the context there and licensing exams, whereas public health doesn't have that external pressure to hit the targets and measure that, you know, learning through uh, passage of a, a licensure exam. So this is the topics we wanted to talk about. Maybe, Carolyn, you want to make a couple remarks and Monica, too, about what you observed. And then we'd like to let you loose talking about the question that you're sitting at the table of, um, and maybe we'll have to get your comments and then we'll make sure we understand the question. Sure. Um, so from my perspective, when Nancy proposed this idea, I found it really engaging. Um, the, uh, I have spent more than a decade at the Kennedy School working to build the teaching and learning uh, unit over there, the SLATE program and the CASE program. And I think the Kennedy School invested incredibly heavily in supporting faculty to teach in a broad array of ways. Um, it's a very heterogeneous curriculum. Um, and I think they had a lot of success in the elective curriculum on an opt-in basis. So individual faculty working alone in their classrooms in their elective courses, which constitute about 90% of their course offerings, um, chose to engage with this incredible array of resources that we provided. But it was a little bit tougher to get really meaningful change um, in the core curriculum. Um, and so now, having recently, very recently, joined the medical school, um, you know, one of the reasons that, that I chose to make that move is I'm really interested in working at scale. Um, and the medical school has decided to do um, what I would describe as a big bang change to the way that they're teaching. 
Um, so it's not just individual faculty opting in, it was faculty working together to define what should our graduates know and be able to do at the end of four years at Harvard Medical School. And they basically worked backwards to redesign competencies, courses, and even change the pedagogy across the board with a much larger faculty than the Kennedy School has. And so for me, that was a really inspiring move. And I joined the team to try to figure out how did they do it? How do we make it successful? Um, and is there anything there that's replicable for other parts of Harvard or other parts of higher ed? So that's kind of the lens that I'm bringing. Great. So um, welcome, everybody. My name is Monica Higgins. So I've been at Harvard's Graduate School of Education for about 12 years now, but before that at Harvard Business School, um, and actually did my PhD work where I spent most of my time in the psych department. So I've kind of gotten to see a lot of different places, parts of the university. Um, and one of the things that strikes me, so this is a learning session, so as we're kind of building off of and kind of tweaking each other's work. When over at the Ed School, we like to talk about the instructional core. So um, teacher, you know, student, and content. And this triangle, um, which I guess, Nancy, we might put in the middle, right? Somewhere, maybe even put students in the middle and structures in the next ring. But this triangle is so key to everything that we do. And then for us at the Ed School, when we think about this, we have this kind of larger external environment, which is comprised of all these rings. But what's interesting at the Ed School that's going on that we really should echo, um, and I'm sorry, what's going on in the environment that we need to echo at the Ed School is this real shift towards thinking about how do we create an environment here in which students are not just kind of engaging in rote memorization and so forth, but really engaging in what we've called, or thought some of the faculty have called deeper learning and complex cognitive thinking skills and project-based learning and all of this, that we're actually you know, enabling our own students to go out and enact and be, a pro be professionals, right? But then we need to do the same thing, right? So we can't sit and lecture and so forth. We, it's, not, it's a lot more than flipped classrooms. I mean, we've gotten rid of courses in some cases. Some cases we have modules. Some cases we have labs. Some cases we are actually consulting to like the, you know, Children's Defense Fund and so forth. And we're doing, we're trying to really recreate the environment that we aspire for our students um, when they leave the ed school. But then that creates really interesting questions as a professional school. We just how do you actually evaluate teaching? So professor has gone from being used to kind of a lecture based or you know PowerPoint, et cetera, some a little bit of flipped classroom, but not that much to a completely different model. Um, how do we evaluate that? How do we teach you know, how do we teach our faculty how to change in that way? Um, how do we select faculty? That's our biggest issue right now. Like we look at their course of but that's nothing has nothing to do with what we want them to do once we get to the ed school. So I guess what I'm saying is like we think about this as kind of a mirror, you know, what's going on in K-12 and how do we create that and inspire our faculty to follow the model that they hope their students will actually go out um, and enact once they leave. So that's why I'm interested in the topic. And you have three so, specific questions. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so at this together. point, we wanted to really use our time together to just foster a conversation among you all um, about um, some of the deeper dive questions that were in the session overview. So you have on your table um, a document that lists the three questions, um, and you have a question number on your table. Um, so we're going to ask each table to discuss as a group one of these three questions. And we're going to have about 20 minutes to do that. And we're going to ask each table to identify one person to kind of share and report out the conversation that you have had about your question. So we'll have multiple groups working on the same question. So we'll, when we do the report out, we'll be able to get some dialogue or interplay between the various groups working on the same question. Um, and then at the very end, uh, we're just going to pull out a few themes. And I want to just give you a heads up, at the, the, just to close out the session, you each have an index card on your table. Um, and we're going to ask you to write down on the index card one thing you learned at today's session and one question that you still have. And we're going to collect those, type them up, and then email out to you the kind of collective work of our group today so that you can kind of use that as fodder for further conversations. And we're also going to share it with Hilt to inform their future work. So, um, so we'll remind you at the end on the index cards. Um, but now, 
uh, so the questions, uh, if you're not at a table that has the question number that you want to work on, now would be the time to move. <laughs> right? So question number one, so if you're at a table with question one, what criteria are used to approve new courses? How is course coherence maintained across a degree program over time? What criteria are used to retire courses? How might the decision-making process affecting uh, processes affect what courses offered and how they can be improved? What a question. Yeah. That's, just one that's question one. <laughs> right? Right. Question two is how is the value of teaching excellence introduced to new faculty? How is it reinforced throughout the faculty member's career, including after tenure? And how might that process be improved? And then question three, what carrots and sticks and pressure points are used to encourage excellent teaching in our research university setting? How can they be more effective? What are the challenges to implementing more effective measures? Nancy and I worked some of these questions in advance, and some of them are actually very difficult, so we're dying to see what you guys come up with from your own settings. So with that, um, make sure that you're at a table that's working on the question you're interested in, and why don't you begin your conversations after you establish a rep workshop. Yeah, so I mean, I just, I think um, given that um, you all kind of randomly sat down at tables, uh, it would be terrific to benefit from hearing from what the table discussions were. I know that you slopped over into different questions. That's fine. <laughs> and it's natural and it's normal. And the questions are interrelated. Um, and there are many questions per question. So um, what we'd like to do now is just make sure that we hear from each of the tables. So there are eight tables. And if somebody, just in terms of the we're pointing at each other as friends, um, can just give us some highlights of the discussion um, just for a couple of minutes. I'm going to just track time, and I'll just kind of give you the signal. If you're going on or if I'm being drawn in, um, you can do that to me. So um, let's start with this table. So you all have the first question. Just I was trying to like bump into Oh, you're like, bumping into it. I thought you were bumping into your so no, 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 yeah. yeah. you're bumping it away. Oh, you're it away. We need to gather your thoughts. Um, Keith, does your table want to get started? And we'll come back then. Oh, all right. I'll take one for the table. All right. Um, <laughs> So we just were, a couple of minutes. Okay, okay. Great. Uh, we were the team, one of the groups that slumped into different questions. Uh, but I, I, I think the the challenge is that we were highlighting the fact that um, we all had different structures, different constituents, um, different processes, protocols, um, and and students that we were trying to serve, or different organizations and regulatory boards, and so. For answering the question, uh, it, it all looked very different for each of us. We need to uh, contextualize who we were uh, and what some of our motivations and guidelines were. Um, also, the fact that um, we also had a different set of core courses versus electives. We also had uh, a different way in which we, we vetted those or different groups that, that helped to, to support those. Um, and I love the fact that um, we also kind of threw in the wild, wild west uh, in, in terms of sometimes it was very organic and, and sometimes it was far more structured in that process. Um, what was the it? I'm sorry. So the, it. Uh, the approval of new courses yep. and what that looked like <laughs> and who taught those and for how long. Um, and one thing that we kind of touched on, well, please jump in uh, if I'm speaking, but uh, some of the information that informed our decisions about new course offerings or different curriculum changes um, may be different uh, policies, different um, what we're hearing from marketing, uh, mm -hmm. different employment demands, uh, um, student surveys, and also uh, what lights up the instructors and the faculty and how to keep all of these different data sets kind of in check uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to add one thing since I, I hung out with you guys a little bit. One of the really interesting, I thought, kind of back and forth was very, um, asking employers what they think, mm -hmm. but then it came up at the table, you know, what do they think the students need to be able to know and be and do and so forth, and then kind of trying to map that back. And then the interesting question that they talked about was, well, it's not even a good question. I mean, do the employers know? I mean, maybe we should be ahead of the game and trying to change that sector. And so that creates that was really interesting. Okay. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, so similarly, just trying to understand each other's contexts. Um, and what we found is the main thing that came out, I think, was around faculty autonomy. So how uh, decisions got made about um, curriculum design and whatnot may, may or may not have been within particular departments or within faculty, but ultimately whether a course got offered or not was based on what the faculty wanted to offer and how much yeah. it would or wouldn't take away from their own research time. Uh -huh. um, but that was also, depends on the graduate level or undergraduate. So we also mm -hmm. talked about um, what it means uh, for FAS mm -hmm. and how departments have to navigate that um, within and um, how sometimes those things are tracked by a staff person within the office, <laughs> within the department who says, hey, we need some good uh, teach over here. Uh -huh. um, like well, you also mentioned how your one of your takeaways was the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. That if you are, if you're maybe if you're not a in the tenure line, you yeah. may not be really even understand the processes that are happening in order uh, to design your uh, or, or to build the curriculum. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. And we also distinguish between the difference between a, a single course and a whole curriculum, and how those structures might. Like be different even within mm -hmm. a single school absolutely i don't even know transparency is part of it too it, it sometimes it's just information not getting to the people who were exactly. enacting the programs right exactly. it's been decided yeah and then all of a sudden we're having to make all these adjustments to program requirements not to mention get the word out to the students that mm -hmm. something's changed mm -hmm. so that's kind of yeah. interesting for a small school but that would be such a challenge I also heard an interesting discussion here about what constitutes teaching. So for example, does adv is advising part of teaching? Or in HBS, writing cases is actually considered part of teaching. Mm -hmm. So that was also an interesting conversation. And you guys also had question one? We Thanks. did, and we have a broad array. So we had the School of Public Health, um, Houghton, excuse me, um, Widener and Vermont Library, um, the medical school, and we're from the college in Romance Languages and Literatures. And so the question of, it's my, what I took from what you said is that people offer the courses they want more or less. Sometimes there's been a proliferation of them and they need to be cut back a little bit because there may be too many. Um, and the decision, there are different bodies in the different, except in apparently well, uh, and the library might have a body, but you didn't mention it. Um, different bodies within schools that determine what's okay. In our particular department, once a course is approved by a committee, I can't remember whose name is, the Educational Something Committee, right. they have to say, no, this, it's not even a course, it's a line of study. But once they've approved what makes a French major, then the freedom within is within the department to say what levels are. And we do have a try to have a balance of courses for undergrads and grads where there's a progression. But that isn't to say that there aren't kinks. Um, and one of the questions that interests me, which someone else had brought up, is how you address a course whose faculty member, it's a core course that repeats, <coughs> but isn't drawing very well. Mm -hmm. um, because it's very delicate to talk to a, a tenured right. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think the faculty who were tenured feel that it's a delicate discussion. Yeah. So that's a tough one. I yeah, think. around evaluation and there isn't. Generally evaluation, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so that was question one, which are kind of what are the different processes and systems in place for bringing a course on board or retiring a course and so forth. Question two um, was just about how the value of teaching excellence is actually even introduced to faculty. Um, how is it reinforced? Um, so question two, folks, can I take your table? Thank you. Sure. Um, so almost all of our group comes from the med school, so I guess we're pretty specific in, in that way. But um, we talked a lot about how new teachers coming in to, from our perspective, um, don't receive a whole lot of introduction as far as mm -hmm. what teaching excellence is or what's um, kind of expected. Um, we actually had a, a new faculty member on our in our group, so we actually had a, a window straight into kind of what she received and um, how helpful that was. And so. 
Um, we talked about that a little bit. And then we also um, we talked about just kind of the buy-in from the leadership team and from people overall. Um, we talked a little bit about the promotion metrics at the med school and how um, within the promotion metrics, every faculty member has to teach for 50 hours a year. But it's a little bit ill-defined as to what those teaching hours are and what's considered teaching. Is it um, actually classroom teaching, or is it teaching at the bedside, or one-on-one -on -one in the lab? Um, um, where does mentorship fall into that, um, and yes. should mentorship be a separate category? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So we also talked about kind of buy-in from leadership as far as their values in teaching. So there is this 50-hour requirement, but a lot of people kind of dread that component <laughs> and make that um, kind of clear to people under them that they, they don't want to be doing those hours. And so if that's mm. the culture that's coming from the top, how can that encourage um, you know, other people to, to kind of buy into this idea that the teaching is, is good and wanting to learn more about it. Um, and overall, we kind of just talked about how the ability to teach is not necessarily something you're born with and that you know, you, there are skills we can learn. And so how are ways that we can start incorporating more of that into mm -hmm. possible? Wonderful. Great. And you all as well had a question, too. Uh, yeah. We, we talked about um, how graduate students are often um, a major venue for uh, instilling the value of teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And that, um, for example, the work of the Box Center in um, uh, providing support for doing that at the department level um, and um, for assisting graduate students with both awareness of their teaching and then of the, of the box center services um, and how um, that there would be an I ideal for doctoral students to have longi longitudinal um, development around mm -hmm. teaching in the time of their degree program mm -hmm. um, and, and the what, what would it take to work towards that in a particular department and that, that would probably look different in different disciplines in different departments. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the opera, you know, we, have, we, we know that there are evaluations, but it's not necessarily clear whether department chairs work with that content or feedback or provide feedback from that, but that that itself would be a signal um, that could be very powerful within yeah. a specific department. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have any particular insight into it, but it struck us as an opportunity. Yep. Um, it, whether it happens or not says something, exactly. um, no matter what the experience is like. Um, and we also talked about how, um, how despite the fact that um, well, we talked about mentoring programs and, and the ability for uh, faculty to mentor each other, but that again, it's not clear the extent to which that ultimately gets focused on research um, uh, agenda and how to um, really be productive with your research agenda as opposed to teaching. So again, there's not a lot of um, structure to make sure. So there's some opportunities for where this could happen, but we were less clear on whether that actually is happening or let alone the effectiveness. Thing. Right. Now I like how you opened up the things for us to think about in terms of opportunities. Yeah. Uh, windows. One so, last opportunity. We were talking about how um, many faculty members often found their passion in their research because they had a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, how could we re reconnect them to mm -hmm. that? Wonderful. early experience yeah. as a motivator. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So interesting. Great. And were you three, three tables I can't see? With two, question two. Yep. Well. Great. Thank you. Um, so we ended up, uh, I think, having an interesting discussion at the spectrum of offerings. So um, we have the business school, so I'm from the business school, Nancy's from the business school, where we have, I think, pretty, the most significantly hands-on uh, new teacher training. So we have a three-day uh, compulsory program uh, for new faculty to come through where they where they observe classes be taught to them as students they teach to themselves and they get feedback on it and then are introduced to the Christensen Center which is a um, administration supported and funded uh, voluntary group of uh, five people who are purely there for their teaching development 
um, to the opposite end of the spectrum at the law school where they're given a mentor when they come in, but it's more self-forming groups around uh, academic interest areas uh, and uh, research areas where they, they kind of get together and talk about the teaching of that, that little moment. And it's not that it's not happening, but it's more informal. So uh, the question is, whose responsibility is teaching excellence then? Is it administrative as a school and as a, uh, as a department that we will set these things in motion and give them financial support and, and administrative support? Or is it the faculty? So one of the things I shared was when the Christensen Center was first established, there was questioning amongst the faculty that a, a center like that would allow and give a pass to tenured faculty to, to miss their mentoring opportunities and, and basically abdicate their responsibility to the junior faculty um, to, to not have to take part in that process of teaching junior mm -hmm. faculty because somebody else is going to do it. Oh. Um, and that the, 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 the burden t is off the shoulders of the senior faculty um, but that their voices are just as important. So as a center, we, we, we learned early to make those voices come into the, to the work of the center. And how do we keep that? But that is then our administrative department's burden of, of maintaining that ecosystem. Right. Uh, so it becomes its own, its own, its own beast. Mm -hmm. And then we, the, the third kind of leg to the stool then is uh, from the library perspective, if you've got a, suddenly a new technology and a new way of using maps and data and analysis and you're training doctoral students but not faculty, mm -hmm. do you not have a responsibility to the, the, the prestige of the university as a whole to, to, to be demanding that faculty understand the, the latest and the greatest for their own good and for the students' good? So it's this, this three-way conversation of, of how do we we don't disagree that excellence is needed. It's who is resp ultimately a great responsible. Question. Yeah. Such a great um, question. And how do we establish that in the community that, right. that we are in personally? Right. So one of the things that became important when we were discussing is that the business school faculty's backgrounds is, is, is pretty diverse. So you could have non-MBAs, Harvard MBAs, other MBAs, uh, practitioners yeah. from 20 years, newly minted PhDs, and that does require some leveling of the field yeah. if you're going to go in and teach 900 students mm -hmm. a core course. Mm -hmm. But at the law school, he was saying that everybody, uh, everybody has a law degree, so everybody has been through a law degree program, mm -hmm. and to the point where it's either like Harvard or Yale has a law degree. <laughs> so, I, I mean, to the point where you have, so you already have an established set of rules right. versus when you don't yeah. have a selection versus rules. development. Yeah, yeah, um, great. All right, this is, this is very helpful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay, we're moving on to question three. So um, question three was what carrots and sticks and pressure points are used to encourage excellent teaching? We're kind of, you know, moving into that realm. I'm pretty sure when we hear from these tables, we'll move back um, to the first question as well. But tell us what you were talking about. How about this table right here? Um, so we, we also touched on, like, the diversity in, in the approaches and of carrots and sticks and pressure points across different um, parts of Harvard. So um, the difference of like needing at the medical school, like some real carrots and sticks for, for why teaching is important there when, when it's not as much of a focus um, in, the, in their practice. Whereas at the ed school where people are teaching about teaching and so that therefore may want to try new things in their classroom or be exposed to what is the latest sort of um, technologies or approaches or, or practices in the classroom. Um, and and we talk a little bit about exposure to, to opportunities. So I think there, it's, it sounds, you know, it's interesting to get this wide perspective because there's sort of a different level of thinking about teaching for new faculty. And um, um, at the ed school, I was, I was hawking my, the instructional moves program, yes. um, <laughs> um, which is really, you know, trying to, trying to sort of get um, the ed school to be a leader, since, since our focus is on teaching and education, to be a leader in sort of dissecting the science of teaching for all four universities. And you should all check out the website. So there thing. Um, but part of the idea there is to really like get teaching down to these bite-sized chunks so that 
you know, it's great to have like a three day teacher development training, but this is sort of an ongoing resource. So yes. if someone, you know, say someone reads their, their teaching evaluation and they're feeling kind of downtrodden <laughs> and they want to do something over the summer or over a break or something, like this is a resource for people to say, I'm going to try something new in the lecturing interactively category because I got some low results on my lecturing feedback mm -hmm. or stuff. So, so that that's sort of a nice um, resource there. And then we also talked about the difference between sort of again like intrinsic motivation, people who want to be good teachers or feel like that's an area they need to improve, versus um, you know extrinsic like give me um, I forgot your name Tamara, Tamara. who teaches um, the freshman writing at FAS and has mm -hmm. like a Q score you know next right. to her name and that is like the difference between her continuing her job or, or not and so um, and one of the things that came up at the end of our discussion was the idea of these less monumentous um, end of course evaluations mm -hmm. and more of things like this you know like this constant feedback and I know at, at school I work on a lot of the online course development and we have weekly course evaluations for the online courses mostly because we don't have as much well we don't have any face-to-face <laughs> -face interaction with the students and so having a weekly evaluation where we're just taking the pulse of yep. the classes or they're saying i found i found this particular reading offensive <laughs> i found that lecture not helpful and it and it's less of what tomorrow was saying this sort of how they're feeling in the moment when they're writing the full course evaluation right. versus right. this right. dialogue about Great. teaching evaluation Great. during the course. Great. Okay. May I throw out a general question that yep. I think would be somewhat controversial? But yep. If I said to the group, I polled the group and said, do you think that everybody on the faculty can be a great researcher? My guess is people would say no. Not everybody who enters the faculty is going to be a great researcher. Why do we assume everybody can be a great teacher? Or do we assume that? And yes, we have lots of faculty development programs to make you a better teacher than you may be. But shouldn't we aspire just to have the great teachers with our students and really rethink? I mean, that's something we've been doing at the med school. We talked about core faculty. But, but that fundamental question, why do yeah. we assume everybody can be a great teacher? Because I think that demeans teaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, what really great educators mm -hmm. are about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we've never... <laughs> really I think that's a terrific question. Um, better versus great. Because certainly, I think we're in the process of learning. Obviously, we're all in part teachers, so we do believe that people can change and grow and learn. And then it kind of depends in part on what your threshold is for great, which might vary depending well, on Also, the medical school. school has three tracks. Yeah, mm -hmm. nobody else does. Well, well so that, that gets to the carrots well, and sticks kind of yeah, thing, too, right? So what we are saying we are prioritizing one over the other because you can't be here as a researcher without being. Yeah. Great, you yeah. know, again, how you define great, yeah. I don't know, but, yeah. you know, by their peers and so Well, every, and every school does have different criteria, right? Promotion criteria, which I heard some tables talk about. In fact, Judy, you, you were talking also about the importance of measurement and understanding for what audiences, and that oftentimes our measurement doesn't necessarily serve the purposes that we need it to serve. So, um, I want to hear from this last table, and then if we want to come back also to this question, we can, we can do it in the time remaining. Yes, well, I think we have seven minutes, so take a couple for your table, and um, then we'll bring it back. Sure, yeah, we talked for a while, and what we sort of realized after talking for a bit was that, in a lot of ways, the incentives that we saw are actually the exact opposite of what you would want. Yeah. In that, you know, for the most part, um, you know, you're not going to get promotion uh, based on your teaching. You can only maybe not get promoted if you have truly uh -huh. business teaching. And so what that does is it um, incentivizes people to explicitly not try something that yeah. might be new and risky. Right. And then we sort of, from there, went to this idea that we also recognize that often good teaching yields bad evaluations because it's harder for the students. And so actually our evaluations are, and we talked about this earlier this morning, are not actually evaluating what we need them to be evaluating. That's great. That's exactly what this table is. And so sort of what we sort of, and recognized was that you know if you you have to align those things so you have to actually create evaluations um, that evaluate what you want but then also take them into account in a way that sort of shows what your values are and right now it sort of shows that actually you know good teaching is not sort of valued over passable teaching because you're not going to really get much benefit 
from excellence you took. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then the incentives end up being more sort of intrinsic incentives, or we talked a little bit, just from my experience, that medical school you end up, you know, with, you get graduate students, mm -hmm. teacher, which is very important actually, but also ends up sort of being intrinsic or separate from any sort of structural um, system. Yeah, great. I love this discussion <coughs> around incentives. So we have five minutes left. I don't mind if you end with questions. I think that that's actually good. And don't forget, we need time to fill up the index cards for the last minute. Yeah, you guys can pull yeah. them out while you're, listening. Out while you're listening. So um, do you guys have a couple of themes you want to share, or you want to take well, a couple I, of questions? I think the incentive question is really interesting. It does vary across schools. I remember when I got a teaching award when I moved over to the Ed School, and I said, is this a good thing? Because I was coming up for a tenure, which is so strange to have to ask. So your, your point about the Ed School, I mean, it's just very interesting because our incentives are not always clear. And yeah, yeah. Why, why so, is it a bad school? Because you're not doing the research. That's what that, no, that, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was obvious. <laughs> like what? Uh, okay, yeah, I think a couple of questions would be sure. great, and then, sure. and then maybe, I, you know, I, I have one big observation that I'd love to hear others. Go ahead. Uh, one of you had, two of you had hands up. Back. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on the incentive thing. It's not yeah. only that great teaching isn't incentivized, it's actually the reward for great teaching is more teaching. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So <laughs> far, it's absolutely yeah. on your time. Um, and sometimes I think bad teaching or like just barely passable teaching is incentivized because yeah. honestly scholarship is where promotion and standing in the community mm -hmm. is and honestly should be. We are a research institution. So if there's a problem, it's not like we can just say, oh, we'll realign our incentives. Teaching is really where it's all at because you know scholarship is and there's only so many hours in the day. So uh, I don't know, it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, uh, I had a different question, but now I'm thinking about this question of the, the balance of research and teaching, which is part of the incentives. And um, I, I'm not sure, it seems like we're living during a pretty historic period where we are rethinking what knowledge is, whether knowledge should be carved up into what we call fields or disciplines. So this 19th century German model of the research university, it seems like we're still taking that for granted, at least in, I would say in FAS, I'm not sure about uh, in other schools, so I'll only speak to that. Um, and you know, I know plenty of students personally who are baffled by the, in, the implicit acceptance that there's a, net, there's a link between research and teaching and that you know, scholar teachers uh, that feeds each other as opposed to say taking somebody who um, actually can communicate and can get people to understand a concept even if that person is not the best in their field or contributing new knowledge. That, and, and I wonder if that uncoupling that or maybe even questioning that as a kind of article of faith uh, in the research university, maybe will help us understand that there are different people who do need different things. Upper people who've committed to a concentration, but then maybe never go back to it, go off and do something completely different, as opposed to a graduate student who's committing to it for life. Uh, I know a lot of freshmen who could care less, really, about the the the, the research. Right. element of their professor's life uh, and don't understand why the teaching is not exactly. prioritized. So, yeah. And I just that? want to build on that. I want to push back a little bit on um, just the, the depth of the focus on research to the point where it crowds out teaching. Um, we had a dean at the Kennedy School that used to say, we're a school. She had to remind people that we're a school. We are not a think tank. There are think tanks out there. Harvard University is not one of them. And so if we're going to accept students, we actually do have an obligation to do a good job in building their skills and their progress towards mastery. And I, I actually wanted to draw a parallel to um, the idea that President Faust raised about creating synergies between your research and your teaching <coughs> to creating synergies about kind of um, being a strong leader or a strong citizen and your teaching. And I think that at the med school, one of the things that struck me most when I got there was that the way that they've defined their competencies for doctors has very little to do with factual knowledge of hard science. I would say 80% of the competencies fall around things like, can you ask the right questions? Yep. Can you empathize with your patient? Are you open to their perspective? Are you going to give them a, a, 
um, uh, care routine that they can actually comply with based on their socioeconomic status. So these are leadership skills. These are communication skills. These are human skills. And in my view, those things are as or more important than any factual knowledge or research knowledge that might come out. Um, so I, I would just pose another alternative. I think we are out of time. I just took my last observation. I teach strategy, organizational strategy. And the one thing that you know, always strikes me in these conversations is how rarely one says we have educational goals that we want to reach and we have a process for making sure that we reach them. Um, and so much of education is indeed this sort of organic, entrepreneurial, individual faculty interest. But does that measure up? Does that sum up to where we want? what we want our students to learn. And the environment in medical school is far more required to go that way because of the external demands. But in these softer fields where there aren't these external demand, demands, yeah. it's not clear to me that the educational goal setting process is one that is linked to the rest of what happens in terms of what gets offered, how programs are designed, what courses. So our, my school really doesn't have a strategic planning process for education, but I, I think, I don't know about other schools, but I think that's one of the missing links for making all of this sort of gel and give people reason for why they teach what they teach that may or may not be related to the research. But this was a fantastic right. conversation. Um, it's great to hear from so many different perspectives. Please spend time thinking about what one thing you learned that you haven't already uh, Or one known. question and you want to ask. You can add a question. One question. It's a sign of a good session if you leave yeah, one good question. question. So thank you. And we'll thank share you. back to you by email. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.